You should consider AWS DynamoDB if your app needs to scale to millions of users, but you should also consider it if your app only has a few users and you need a database solution that's free or nearly free. Okay, so what's the catch then? Why doesn't everyone use DynamoDB? Well, the only catch is that your schema needs to conform to some very specific constraints, but if your application can accommodate those constraints, it can save you from a ton of setup, maintenance, availability, and scalability problems that other databases have. Let's consider two example use cases and whether they're a good fit for DynamoDB. The first is a blogging website where we need to store blog posts, and this can actually be a really good fit for DynamoDB. The second use case is an analytics platform for a video streaming service. And this actually turns out to be a terrible fit for DynamoDB. Now we'll dive into both of these use cases later and look at why or why not they're a good fit for DynamoDB. But first, let's talk about what DynamoDB brings to the table. DynamoDB can handle pretty much any traffic volume or data size that you throw at it. Database nodes can be added or removed as needed, and your data is automatically migrated between them as necessary. That's really nice compared to traditional databases. Rows in DynamoDB tables are referred to as items, and each item must have a partition key and optionally a sort key. Partition keys are a little bit like primary keys in SQL databases with some subtle differences. Items can also have a sort key, which adds a lot of flexibility when querying for your data. Beyond partition key and sort key, items can have any number of attributes, which are sort of like fields in a SQL database. Now, one thing to note about Dynamo is that it doesn't enforce a strict schema, so all the items in a table don't necessarily have to have the same attributes. Consider that blog web application we mentioned earlier. We want to create a Dynamo table where each item represents a blog post. The application supports multiple blogs, and each blog might potentially have multiple blog posts. So we're going to create a table where the partition key is a blog ID, the sort key is a date timestamp when a blog post was made, and then we're going to have three attributes, the author of the blog post, the title of the blog post, and the actual content of the blog post. So I've already created this table. We'll, we'll go into table creation later, but we're going to click create item and we're going to put blog one as a partition key and then this date timestamp as the sort key, which is when the blog post was made. We're going to add an attribute for author it's going to be Bob and then add a string attribute for title, uh, first post, and then we're going to add the content of the post, which is hello world. And just like that, we've created our item. One thing to note about partition key and sort key is that the combination of the two make up the primary key of an item. And primary keys of items must be globally unique in a table. So I wouldn't be able to create another item in this table with a partition key of blog one and a sort key with this timestamp. You can add another item with the same partition key and a different sort key. I'm gonna create a second item with a different timestamp, different author, and it should let us do that. And I can add another item with the same sort key but a different partition key. I've changed the partition key to blog two and it should let me create that. All right, so now we have three items in our table. Now that we stored some simple data in the database, let's look at how to query that data. The first way to get data from a Dynamo table and one you should avoid whenever possible is called a scan. And a scan literally just reads every item from the database. In most cases, really the only reason you should ever use a scan is if you're manually looking through the data in the AWS console. Performing a scan in your application code is almost always a bad idea. It's extremely costly and not nearly as performant as the other way to get data, which is called a query. So when I go to explore items here in the AWS console and I click run, it's actually loading all the data from the table, which is what we want in some cases. Now, when I do a scan in the console here, we do have this filters drop down here where you can specify an attribute name and a value to filter on. This actually gives you a false sense of security because it's still actually reading the entire table, even if you add filters. Filters can be useful for pruning the data that gets sent back to the client, but from a performance perspective, they don't really help much. Now let's talk about the way you really should be retrieving data in your application which is using queries. Queries are the most efficient way to get data from a Dynamo table, both from a performance and a cost perspective. Now, if you're coming from a traditional database background, queries are where the extra constraints imposed by Dynamo become a little more apparent. Queries are always gonna match for exact equality for the partition key. So I can specify a partition key blog one, and it'll give me all the entries with the partition key blog one. I cannot say, give me all the items with a partition key that starts with blog, for example. It's always exact equality. I can't do ranges. I can't do greater than, less than. I can't do comparisons. Partition keys are always exact equality in queries. This is the aspect of Dynamo that makes schema design a little more interesting. Sort keys, however, give a lot more flexibility. I can do ranges, greater than, less than. I can do begins with. So say I wanna get all the blog posts that happen in April, for example, in blog one. I can do sort key begins with 2022-04. And it'll give me both these entries because they both happened in April. Sort key gives some nice flexibility. 
But note that there's no way you can omit the partition key. There's no way I could do, give me all the posts across blogs, across different blogs, that happened in April of 2022. There's no way to do that. You can't do, give me all the items with a sort key that begins with April across all partition keys. There's no way to do that. So I could do blog two here for the partition key and give me the only blog two post. There's no way I can get all three records with a query. What I've just described to you is how you'd query a Dynamo table out of the box. But what if you need a little more flexibility? For example, what if instead of querying by date time, I want to query all the posts in a blog that were written by a given author? Now for that, we can use something called a local secondary index. And a local secondary index is essentially a way of adding an extra option for sort key. So I chose the date time stamp as my sort key. If I add a local secondary index on another attribute, in this case, author, I can query by blog ID and author instead of blog ID and post date time. We'll get into how to create a local secondary index in a bit, but I've already created this local secondary index and I just need to select it from my index dropdown. And now I can query by partition key, which is the same as before, blog one, and then author, which I wanna get the, all the posts that were written by Bob. Run that. And now I get the only post that was written by Bob. The other posts in blog one, it was written by Alice. I'm gonna mention it again when we get into creating tables, but it's really important to note that local secondary indexes must be created at the time the table is being created. There's no way to create them after the table's already been created. So that's a very important thing to note. The other type of index in Dynamo is called a global secondary index. And you use global secondary indices when you wanna query by something other than your original partition key. So say I wanna query for all the items with a certain title. I can create a global secondary index on title. Now creating a global secondary index is almost like creating the table all over again, but specifying a different partition and sort key. And behind the scenes, it actually is like creating a duplicate table, more on that in a second. But you can see here, I can specify a partition key and a sort key for this new index. I'll specify title as a partition key and SK as a sort key. So my partition key that I can query for exact equality on will be the title of the blog post. And the sort key will actually be the same sort key as the original partition key, which is the date time that the post was posted. It doesn't have to be this way. You can actually select any attribute you want for the sort key. I could potentially specify content as a sort key. That would allow me to do queries like query for all the blog posts with a given title and that start with a given string of characters. But in this case, I'm just gonna use the date time as a sort key for this index. The interesting thing about global secondary indices that's different from the partition and sort keys for the original table is that Partition and sort keys on global secondary indexes don't have to be globally unique on the table. So I'm choosing title as my partition key and SK as my sort key. It's actually okay to have two items in the table that have the same title and same sort key. That's fine. If we query for a specific title, both of those items would appear in the response. When you create a global secondary index, you'll notice these capacity settings here. And that's because a global secondary index is almost as if you're creating a completely separate table that stores an exact copy of the data of the original table. That's important to be aware of, both from a cost and performance perspective. You actually have to scale your global secondary index based on the volume of queries that use that index, just as you would specify capacity for your original table. Now, don't worry about what these values mean. Uh, we'll get to that in a second when we go over table creation, but just something to be aware of for now. Global secondary indexes can be costly. Local secondary indexes are similar in that they use extra capacity. The capacity they use actually piggybacks on the original table. So you'd have to scale your original table with those local secondary indexes in mind. Now with each global secondary index or GSI or local secondary index or LSI, comes additional capacity requirements for each read and write to that table. Because GSIs and LSIs store copies of the data to accommodate queries that use them, that means each read and write to the table is gonna use extra resources that it otherwise wouldn't have if you have those indexes. This is really important to be aware of because if you're creating lots of indexes, more than one or two, for example, either Dynamo is probably not a good fit for your use case or you're designing your schema in a suboptimal way. So yeah, if you're creating tons of indexes, you're kind of foregoing the benefits that Dynamo is gonna give you. And it may be worth considering a traditional SQL database instead. Now that we know about queries and secondary indexes, let's look at how these things influence schema design, which can actually get pretty interesting. Idiomatic DynamoDB schema design can actually be pretty different from relational database schema design. Typically with relational database schema design, we're primarily focused on minimizing data duplication. So we have multiple tables and each table might have a foreign key that references a record in another table. With DynamoDB, we're primarily concerned with accommodating our access patterns. 
This actually may involve data duplication if it suits those access patterns. Let's take a closer look at each of those use cases I mentioned in the beginning. First, the blogging website. This turned out to be a pretty good fit for Dynamo. Since it's pretty unlikely that we'll ever need to query for posts on two different blogs at the same time, blog ID is actually a really good fit for partition key. The date timestamp that a blog post was made is a good fit for sort key because that gives us the ability to query for all posts that were made after a certain date and before a certain date, which is something that we'd likely wanna do. Now let's talk about the video streaming service. The goal of this analytics platform is to surface what users watch which videos and for how long and things like that in the form of graphs. And those graphs would be computed based on some kind of ledger of video views. An example of a line item in that ledger would be user A watched video X for 50 minutes, for example. And this is an awful fit for DynamoDB because there's some metadata associated with each user, there's metadata associated with each video, and each of those sets of metadata can change. That ledger of video views will tie a user to a video watched, and the data for that user and the data for the video might actually change. A SQL database is a really natural fit for this because you can have a views table that has two foreign keys that point to the user's table and the video table respectively. So if the user's name changes or the title of the video they watch, that changes, you would just have to update those respective tables and then the view ledger would reflect those changes. Those sort of relationships would be really hard to model and query efficiently in Dynamo. The other reason a relational database is a better fit is because it'll allow you to do complex aggregations at the database level so that less data is sent back over the wire to populate those graphs. If we did this with Dynamo, we'd have to go grab all the data from the database and then do those aggregations at the application level, which is less than ideal. Now let's go look at what's involved in actually creating a Dynamo table. So we'll go to tables in the console, create table. The first few things we'll need to configure are the table name, of course, and the partition key and the sort key. So we'll do posts to, a lot of Dynamo users actually like to name their partition key and sort key in a really vague way because it's possible to store multiple types of data in one Dynamo table. We're gonna name ours generically, PK for partition key and SK for sort key. Because in addition to posts, we might decide later that we want to store, for example, comments on those posts in the same table, which in the Dynamo world, is actually okay. If you've been working with relational databases for a while, thought of that is gonna make you scream. You're not gonna be happy, but that's the idiomatic way to do things in the Dynamo world sometimes. Because then if we include our comments in the same table, that gives us the ability to potentially query for posts and all comments on that post at the same time. You don't have to do it that way. You can give these very specific names. You could potentially name this like blog ID or something and then uh, like sort key post time if you wanted. Then there's this settings radio button. Default settings are likely fine if you're prototyping something or something's not in production yet. Customize settings, if you, if you choose default settings here, you're essentially done and you can go ahead and click create to create the table. If you wanna add local secondary indexes, you wanna change the storage class of the table, or if you're gonna to wanna to manually specify the capacity of the table, you're gonna to wanna to select customize settings. Table class has cost implications. DynamoDB standard has cheaper reads and writes, but more expensive storage. Standard IA has more expensive reads and writes, but cheaper storage if you're storing a ton of data. The thing is, DynamoDB standard has a 25 gigabyte free tier for storage. So if you're under that, you're not paying anything for storage. So I think in the vast majority of cases, the storage for standard is still gonna be cheaper than standard IA. Standard IA is only gonna be beneficial if you're not reading and writing a lot and you have a ton of data. I mean, you have to have a lot of data for that to be worth it. The vast majority of people are probably gonna choose DynamoDB standard for table class. Now we get into capacity and capacity is all around predicting what sort of traffic volume your table needs to accommodate. There's two main capacity modes. One is on demand, which is the easier one. And then there's also provisioned. Provisioned allows you to specify capacity up front to get a lower cost potentially. With on demand, you don't have to specify anything. Dynamo will service all the requests it gets and you'll get billed for those requests later, but at a higher per request cost than provisioned. Provisioned allows you to specify the exact number of capacity units, both for reading and writing. I'm gonna completely oversimplify the definition of read and write capacity units here. The actual capacity used by a read or a write depends on a lot of factors, but out of the box without any fancy configuration or changes, one read capacity unit is roughly equal to two reads per second. So, so compute the number of reads per second you need to accommodate, divide that by two, and that should be roughly the number of read capacity units you're gonna need. Write capacity units are exactly the same, but for writing. It does support auto scaling. So if you start getting traffic volume greater than what the table is currently scaled for, Dynamo will actually add nodes and increase that capacity automatically. The thing about that is it'll actually throttle requests between the time it realizes that it needs to scale up 
and the time that extra node finishes being set up, during that window, Dynamo is actually gonna respond to those queries with 400 responses. So that's something that's super important to be aware of. There are mechanisms in the AWS SDK to automatically retry when it receives a 400 response for throttling, uh, but that's definitely something to be aware of. If your traffic is really unpredictable or bursty, you might actually wanna go with the on-demand capacity mode, or if you're using provision capacity mode, make sure those minimum capacity units are above what you think you need. The secondary indexes section is where you create LSIs and GSIs. Really important thing to note here, I said it before and I'll say it again, this is your last chance to create an LSI or local secondary index for the table. If you do not create one here, you will not be able to later. I wish there was a huge warning about this here, but there's not. So definitely note, if you need a local secondary index, do it here. Global secondary indexes or GSIs, you can create here or you can create them later. The last thing to configure here is encryption. If you're worried about somebody gaining physical access to the machine that the database is running on, you can encrypt the database to prevent them from gaining access to your data. And that's about it. We can create the table now. That's a quick overview of when and why to use DynamoDB and why it's a lot better than relational databases for certain use cases. It's not gonna be a good fit for every use case. In fact, there's a lot of use cases it's a horrible fit for. I think some people default to a relational database right out of the gate without considering other options. There's definitely a lot of use cases, especially ones that involve large scale that are a really good fit for Dynamo and using Dynamo will save you a lot of pain compared to using a relational database. Let me know in the comments if you've had any good or bad experiences with Dynamo and let me know if you have any questions on any we've covered. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.